shore batteries and the heavy guns of the French battleship Jean Bar and several cruisers, destroyers and gunboats put out a devastating fire. Gunnery from American ships coupled with precision bombing silenced those guns. Striking inland from the beaches north and south of the city, shock troops cut the railways, other lines of communication, then converged upon the town. Two days later, the Germans invaded unoccupied France, whereupon Admiral Darlan, declaring Pétain a prisoner of the Axis and himself chief of state, ordered the cessation of hostilities. In proof of the surprise of our landings, German armistice commissions were caught flat-footed in each city. Their jobs, to bleed North Africa of her raw materials and farm products. The people of North Africa were evidently not sorry to see them go. Events moved swiftly. To Algiers came General Anderson, commanding the British First Army. General Giraud took command of the French land forces. United under General Eisenhower, they were ready to take the field. Once more, the Tricolour, the Stars and Stripes, and the Union Jack flew side by side. But the enemy had lost no time. Across the Mediterranean, by sea and by air, he was pouring men and equipment into Tunis and Bizerta. Despite this, we determined to start the campaign at once, hoping to reach the distant cities before the enemy's grasp had become too strong. This was a bold decision, for the British First Army was as yet little more than one division, and the bulk of the American forces were needed to safeguard our position in Morocco. We had other disadvantages. Roads were poor. Railways inadequate. The enemy beyond the mountains had short supply lines from Sicily and Sardinia. Our own, stretching forward from the improvised base at Algiers, were four times the length. Even more important, we lacked as yet forward airfields whereas the enemy in Tunisia had all the permanent airfields he needed. In less than a month, the weather would break. Could our slender force, in the last days of autumn, achieve a flashing success against time and a stronger enemy? With immense energy, the attempt was made. By road, Allied infantry, tanks and artillery moved towards the hills. By rail, went General Giraud's men with mules for mountain transport. By air flew British and American parachutists to capture suitable ground for airfields and the tactical points nearby. By sea, went commandos to Bougie and Bone, the latter 300 miles to the east and only 60 miles from the Tunisian border. Here, the airfield which our parachutists had taken was already under attack from the Luftwaffe.
was our only permanent forward airfield and had to be fought for repeatedly. In three columns, we advanced towards Tunis and Bizeta. And still the enemy poured into Africa. By mid-November, a thousand a day. Among them, Marshal Kesselring, Mediterranean commander-in-chief, the man who had made his name infamous at Warsaw and Rotterdam. November the 18th, 10 days after our first landings, our mixed force of Allied troops had crossed the frontier into Tunisia and skirmishes were frequent. Small units of French, British, Americans held up here, gaining there, fighting roads as well as Germans, but pushing on. By November the 22nd, we were in Beja, 450 miles on the road to Tunis. News came that 30 miles on, the French under General Barre were holding Mejez El Bab against the Germans. The French were fighting stubbornly, equipped with little more than machine guns and rifles. General Anderson promptly moved to support them. Together, we held measures, henceforth a pivotal point, and forced the Germans back. But now we went into the plains and were increasingly exposed to the enemy's more numerous tanks and aircraft. November the 25th, the first real tank clash. Fifteen enemy tanks destroyed, and the rest withdrew. And on we pushed towards Tunis and Bizet, racing against time and the weather. Sixty miles from Bizet, fifty miles, forty miles. Our supply lines inexorably thinning, our reinforcements fewer and fewer. Thirty miles from Bizet, twenty miles, eighteen miles from Tunis, sixty, fifty. And from the hills, our patrols saw the city. But now the enemy attack rose to a crescendo. From the skies, a bombardment to which we had no adequate answer. Casualties heavy. Even as the goal was in sight, the race had been lost. This first thrust, this adventurous gamble, had failed. We fell back to the protection of the hills, 